Well, we recently had a neighbor call the, call the town council office to request the removal of the deer crossing sign by the hospital. True story. The reason was too many deers are being hit by cars out here, she said. I don't think this is a good place for them to be crossing anymore. That's what she said. Right there. And that's the rest of the story. So as corny as that was, we'll forget that. Okay. I just read that the other day and I thought it was funny. Deb's laughing now. You'll get it. It's a time joke. So you laugh when you have time. <laughs> but just think about that. The deer crossing. I mean, if you have to explain it, it's just not funny anymore. Well. Oh, what's all this? Oh, that's good. I'm looking at it. Boy, I've been time traveling. We're on page five already. Oh, God, that's really, I've heard about this before, but I didn't know it happened so quick. Awesome. What do we got up there? What do we got? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, how do you go black? Uh, well, that's kind of cool. All right. Well, let's do this, let's do this first. Because Pete's, Pete's working on this one. So. Let's do our word. Y'all like these word decorations? It is so weird speaking to eight people. It's kind of strange. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that online. <clears throat> Maybe y'all should move up here and you'll see the back of your head. And think, it's a steady only crowd today. <laughs> but those of you who are watching, seriously, you know, we're in the middle of a Category 5 snowstorm. And, uh, you know, people aren't coming. There's, there's floods, ice. There's the threat of ice. You know, in Alaska, so people aren't coming today. You know what's kind of funny? Some of you know I really I grew up in Georgia. And when I was in ninth grade, honestly with this true story, when I was in ninth grade, the uh, the, the alarm came over the high school and they were dismissing did you hear this story? They were they were dismissing everybody because there was the threat of snow flurries. And the threat, the system was in Macon, Georgia, and it was 160 miles away. And there was a threat of snow flurries, so they wanted to get all the students home so that they could make it in, in time of these snow flurries. And there was actually a couple flurries that came down. No less, and we got, the school was dismissed. So, there you go. <clears throat> Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light in my path. It is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It is God breathed and is inspired to teach, rebuke, and train me in righteousness. I read this by myself. I will not just listen to the word, I'll do what it says. I'm blessed because I hear the word and I act upon it. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living, never ready seed of the word of God, and I will never be the same. Everybody in agreement said, Hey! Man. All right, so here we go, right here. Next slide. Here's a, a favorite pa a pastor friend, and not a friend, I don't really know him, but I really like a lot of his stuff. But Stephen Furter said, it's not what people see in you that gives you the advantage. It's what God sees in you that gives you the advantage. And I like to highlight the word that God gives advantage. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about a new, a new series that we're doing. And the new series is right here. And it's do you sir, I'm sorry, see yourself here. Now, these kids here are actually part of Impact Church in London. And you know, there's Maddie there, a big old smile, and, and George, and you know, all them up there. It's really awesome. But how I many know that's a decoration? We want to put it on the sign. We actually want to get start branding some things and actually put the see yourself here on the back of a shirt. And so we're getting the designs ready for t-shirts and apparel and hats and sweatshirts and underwear and I mean everything out there so that we can be totally branded, you know, through the loom, right? So we'll just have stuff like that working out in the gym. I've actually been to the gym twice <laughs> in the last few months. And you know, it's, it's been great. I, I went in there and I bought a sweatshirt and I didn't want to sweat in it, so I, I left. But I did go to the gym to buy a sweatshirt. And uh, I, I thought it was really good. It was on sale, so I thought, uh, I did my time. But I did go on the treadmill for five minutes, and I was so bored. I, was, I wasn't even going anywhere. And I was just like, this is kind of the craziest thing. And I went home, and I was all sore, and it just wasn't a good thing. But, you know, you know see, see yourself here. I mean, it's not, can you see yourself here? Will you see yourself here? See yourself here. And so that's going to be the title for the next few weeks. But this morning, I want to talk about this subject right here. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? So before we jump into Judges 
chapter 6, verse 12, I want to go to a really favorite scripture of mine. And it's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, King James Version. Miracles still happen today. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says that, and this, this will tie into Judges. He said, through faith we understand that worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I mean, all some things we can only understand by faith. That through faith we understand. That some things we can only understand by faith. That the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are not seen were not made of things which do appear. I did a word study a number of years ago. And it was based on... Um, this scripture here in um, Hebrews 11, 11, 3. And I took the word worlds. And the worlds means specific allotted periods of time within the history of mankind. So it talks about decades, centuries, millenniums, things of that nature. And when you put that together back with the scripture, it says that through faith we understand that different time periods within the history of mankind, decades, generations, centuries, millenniums, have all been framed by the spoken word of God. When it was power in God's word and what God says over you and what God says over reason. So then I took the word worlds, I mean frame, and I broke it down. And it means to take an already existing thing and change or alter its outward form and shape. So then we talk about recreating, reshaping, remolding, the altering of something that is already in existence. So when you take the word Worlds, and you take the word frame and you put it back in the scripture. I don't do crazy stuff like this. It means that through faith we understand that different time periods, decades, centuries, millenniums, generations within the past history of mankind have been completely altered, remolded, and reshaped and refashioned by the word of God. And so I'm thinking about all this here today. And if if all of that can literally change, if the word of God can change a region. Then how many know that the word of God can change a person? So with that, I want you to go to Judges chapter 6 and verse 12. And it says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Y'all know this one. When the, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. There he is. And it's not Gideon chapter 6. That is, that is a little bit of a, they fix it after the closer. When the angel of the Lord appeared again, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I thought about this this morning, that I've often wondered what the Lord has said about me that I did not believe. That God has said specific things directed to you that you shall be or you shall become. How many have had a, a prophecy in, over your lifetime that you're going to do this and, and you're going to see this and you're going to be that? And then sometimes, you know, you're, you don't step out in faith as much as you step out of fear. And sometimes it's only through faith that we understand what God has been doing behind the scenes because things don't always appear as they seem. I don't remember growing up, you're going to the car, but you see, you see the fun house. And I think I have some fun house pictures back here. <laughs> and they, 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 the fun house pictures are all those crazy wavy mirrors. And when you look at those fun house mirrors, as you look at the image of yourself, the image is clear. The image is, is not clear anymore. It, it's distorted. It is distorted because it's not a perfect mirror. It's an imperfect mirror. And you see all kinds of different shapes and patterns and forms and we kind of make things. But what appears is really not you. It's just a picture of what it says that you look like. And I, I think about this, that when we're growing up, the people all around us are like the mirrors in our life. They reflected back to you how you begin to see yourself. The problem is that there are no perfect people. So as a result of the image that you the images that you've got of yourself, even from people who loved you, they were distorted. And so what I mean by that is sometimes that we, we have to start seeing from God's point of view. And not necessarily what people or your peers or your friends say that you should you should look like or or, or what you should act like. And how many of you would agree that maybe your life isn't what you thought it would look like now when you were a kid? My kids are like that. I have four. I thought they would all be in the NFL. Huh? No, four boys. I have five kids, four boys. Destiny's not going in the NFL. I know that she would be, you know, like, I don't know. 
Actually, we probably should have had ten. <clears throat> but we got five. So the point is, I had four boys, Cheryl, that I thought that they were all going to be in the NFL. Okay? <clears throat> And it never ended up like that. I had two that were jocks and the other two that were all more artsy and, and all this kind of stuff. But as a dad, you're thinking, oh, they're going to grow up and, you know, they're going to be a doctor or they're going to be a lawyer or they're going to, you know, pay for my house when they go. I actually taught my kids and it, and it didn't even work. I told them, when you leave home, then 5% of your income comes back to mom and dad. And as a young person, I'm like, okay, dad, that's fine. I'm not going to do that. And then when they started making money, I started getting nothing. And then I soon found out that they went off to college and I still was paying them sorry self. And then I kept getting all these letters, you know, no, you know, to, you know, no, no money, no fun, your son. You know, and I had to send them back letters. Too bad, so sad, your dad. You know, and I'm still waiting on those times where they're gonna start giving me some money. But how many sometimes the, the, the life handed you, you know, that the life handed you a whopper, but it didn't even look like a commercial. You know, that, and, and we see that at Switzerland, we went to Switzerland the other day. How embarrassing that was. I went there after work and Cheryl said, let's go on a date. I was like, you're on, baby. And so we went to Switzerland and we saw this perfect picture of this plump piece of chicken. And we got that thing, that taco was no bigger than half my hand or a breast. I thought, what? I just got the chick. I didn't even get the chicken. I just got the breast of a chick. What is up with this? That, the, that what I got on my plate didn't even resemble anything what, what the picture was. And how many of you ever got something that you ordered and it was nothing like what you ordered in the picture? And it's very difficult to adjust your perspective when you pictured it one way and the product turned out to be another thing. I get frustrated with that. And some people have even walked in here in the past and they say, well, that wasn't what I pictured. It wasn't what I hoped for. I don't get bummed up by those things because my response is, that's right, it's more than what you picture. Because you might have just pictured a nice little choir. And you might have you might have just, you know, pictured somebody coming in like penguins in a, in a choir. That ain't what it is because, you know, our whole culture is freedom. Our culture is, if you don't want to sit, you can worship. If you got flags, you can swing from the flags if you want. I don't care. You know, because we want to have a culture of freedom in our worship and, and freedom and expression. And people come in and, oh, you guys are honest to God. People come in and, oh, you're too happy. I swear that I had a guy say that. He said, oh, I've been to that church. They're too happy. I, he, said, he said, I think church should be solemn and quiet and reserved. I'm like, I'm, that's cool. If that's what your culture is, God bless you. There's plenty of places like that. We're just not that way because he who the sun sets free is whoop, free to me. We're free to worship. Maybe you're living in a scene that you didn't picture in this season. Maybe you're living in a scene that you didn't quite picture in this season. And that's why in Hebrews, there's a contrast from what God sees now that neither one, that even, even Gideon even couldn't see. That God calls Gideon, he says, he says, you're a mighty warrior. But Gideon is thinking that he's a mighty weenie. He's thinking that he's weak. He thinks that he's insignificant. And every one of us has a picture that was given to you as a kid that your parents made you tattoo in your brain of what life was supposed to look like through their eyes. And I don't know about you, but how many of you are not living the life that your parents pictured for you right now? How many of you don't even look like what your parents pictured you were going to look like now? I've got this growth. I don't know. I didn't have a growth when I was a kid. I didn't have it when I was in college, but somehow, <clears throat> once I hit 40, I got this growth, and the sucker just won't go away. People call it a pulpit bumper, but I'm like, ah, it's pretty disgusting. I didn't think I would have a pulpit bumper. I didn't think I'd have a tumor on my stomach. I didn't think I'd have that, and the more I try to work it off, it seems like the bigger the thing gets. It's just like it's stubborn. How many of you are not even doing what your parents pictured for you right now? The question is, where did you get that picture from? It's kind of like this picture of the puzzle. <clears throat> not, oh, I'm not going to go back to that one. This is kind of funny. Warning, objects in the mirror may bear no relation to reality. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you see yourself when you go to the gym. But that's how I see myself when I go to the gym. But I talk about this missing piece, this missing puzzle. Because sometimes the, pic sometimes the picture that your parents painted for you 
isn't really what it's, what it's like. They might have had a dream. They might have had an aspiration. They might have had a desire what you were supposed to do with your life. And they might have, might have had a thought of what you were supposed to look like in your life. But then it changes because their perspective might have been like the waves, the curvy waves of the mirror. And they're like, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way. But in reality, when reality sets in, it bears no resemblance of what maybe your parents had prophesied what your picture was going to look like. So you have an imperfect picture of where you're at. I was doing Uber a number of years ago, and this gal came in, and I picked her up from uh, Fanshawe College in London, and, and she asked me this question like I'm supposed to know. She goes, how did I get here? I said, girl, I don't know, man. I could come and pick you up from Uber and take you where you wanted to go. She said, all I remember is being at Jack's, and then I woke up this morning being here. I said, hmm. So we just got talking. I kind of put the two, two together. I knew what was going on. But we started <clears throat> talking. And she says, she was all bummed out. She loved crying and whatnot. And she says, man, I'm at Western, and I hate my degree. I hate what I'm studying. I said, well, why are you doing that? Because that's what my parents told me I was supposed to do. I said, well, that's really weird because now you've got a distorted picture of your life. You're painting a picture of your life of what your parents said that you were supposed to do, and you hate it, and all you're doing is pleasing your parents because they pictured what you're supposed to be doing right now. And she says, I don't like that. She said, and she said, it doesn't matter how much, how, how I, uh, she said, how did she put it? Um, it, she said, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't, I can't, I can't fit their picture. I shave off the puzzle pieces, I try to do it, and no matter, it just won't go. It's like, it's like that crazy, most that plastic circular kid thing when we have, you put the triangles in the circle and all that. It's, it doesn't matter what you do, it just doesn't work. And how many of you are like that? Sometimes even for myself. I'm like, man, I hear these really cool, perfect, polished pastor guys, and they got, and Glenn, Glenn is awesome. He's disgustingly awesome because he, he just knows the word. He just, just the words come out. I'm like, ooh, I just love hanging around him because it just oozes out. But I'm like, I'm not like that. And no matter how hard I try to be like that, I can't be like that. And if I try to be somebody else, then I'm just a hypocritical version of them. God says, just be you. I know I don't have to get it. You don't need to tell me that. I have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She tells me that every day. I don't need you to tell me that, but it's just it's awesome. She said, just be you. I go, oh, that's cool. I can be me. It may not be the picture-perfect pastoral, you know, picture of what people want, but I just be me. And I, I was sharing it with that girl. I said, you know what? Quit trying to shave yourself in fashion and remold and renew yourself just to fit into your, your parents' picture of what you're supposed to be like. Have you ever thought that God made you unique? Have you ever thought that maybe God will bring the puzzles that connect with your picture or your, your piece of your puzzle? That God will bring these pieces together and all of a sudden he has a design for you. That may be totally different than what your peers have said. And she started to weep even more. She said, I never had anybody speak to me like this. And I'm driving my Uber, she's in the back. And she, I've never seen her again. I said, let me just, let me just pray with you. I'm like, what do I got to do? I'm gonna lose my Uber job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so listen, man, I'm just gonna pray that, that you know, God's gonna bring the, connect the right pieces together. And that he's gonna have a, he's gonna have a, 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 a perfect canvas. And when it's all said and done, you're going to look back and go, ah, so God has something specifically planned for my life. I'm telling you, there's a missing piece, there's a missing puzzle. And sometimes we just, we just have to change things just a little bit. The way we think all, the way we think determines the way we act. And what we see comes out of our lifestyle. And our beliefs determine our behavior. And often we're acting on a false or an inaccurate information about ourselves. But as we begin seeing through the lens of Jesus, Things truly begin to change. If you got your picture of what your life is supposed to be like from the imaginary world of Instagram or Facebook, then you're certainly believing in a fantasy. Because not everything is what it seems on Facebook or Instagram. It's cut out, it's framed, it's polished. It's cropped it. It's edited. And everybody on Facebook, the 
they have an image of what they want to what they what they want you to believe. And when you finally get a hold of them on Facebook, half the time so many people don't even look like the airbrush version that they put on there. I had a friend in one of my previous businesses and and uh, on her Facebook it was all you know yachts and a big house in Jacksonville and all this kind of stuff. Come to find out. The picture that she had painted for everybody to believe really wasn't what her life was all about. Come to find out she did have a big house, but when you open up the doors, it was empty because they had to sell off all their furniture to pay all their bills. They had the big house, that was the perception. But there wasn't anything in the big house. Oh, there were yachts, but that's because the, the, the husband was a yacht salesman, he didn't own them. And they couldn't even pay the rent, they couldn't even pay the mortgage because he hadn't sold a yacht in two years. But the picture and the perception was that I have a yacht in the driveway. I have a big truck in the, in the driveway that didn't belong and it belonged to the dealership. And I had a big old house that I was struggling you know, to pay my mortgage and they were doing garage sales on Saturdays just to get enough money for food. The sad thing is sometimes we look at people's pictures and it's not exactly the way it is. I don't know if y'all get something out of this or not, but I hope so. And then there's this crazy show on TV, This Is Us. I was thinking about that. That's not even real. What's that guy's name? The, the husband. Jack? Jack. Seriously? Jack is perfect all the time. The dude hardly ever gets angry. I know you probably haven't seen it. Don't worry. It's a waste of time. No, <clears throat> we, we were addicted. We watch it all the time. This is us. It is everything is cropped and everything is staged. Everything is perfect. He hardly ever gets angry with his kids. I don't know. Maybe you're like Jack. Maybe you're not. I've gotten angry with my kids. I don't. I love them. I don't like them all the time. But <clears throat> I love my kids. Sometimes I'm like, I don't like you today. I don't like what you're doing. But sometimes we see stuff on TV that's all cropped and, and it's just not completely accurate. God works from an invisible picture that we can't see until it is made visible and then I can't see. And Gideon had no idea. And God saw something special in Gideon. Gideon had no idea what God saw in him until it was revealed. And a lot of people, even they have a, a skewed version of what Jesus looks like. I mean, you think about that one. Is he black? Is he white? Is he olive? Did he have a beard? Last time I checked, there was no cameras back then. There's no Facebook, there's no none of this. But we have this thing. You know, was he Buffy Carpenter? Was he skinny? Did he shave? What, what was he like? But we have this idea of what he's, what he's like. And I don't know, sometimes, sometimes just because you, you can't just because you can't see the perfect picture of who Jesus is, it doesn't mean that he's not there. If I were to do a video right now, and the video is showing I'm probably out of, the, out of the scene. But if I'm in the scene, let's just say I'm watching right now, and say I'm in the scene, and people hear me, and they see me, and they see the visible me. But when I step out of the, out of the scene, I'm still there. They may not be able to see, I'm here, but if I step out of the scene, they can't see me, but they hear me, and they know that I'm here because my sheep hear my voice. Amen. And just because someone comes up to you and says, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. If, if scripture's right and it says my sheep hear my voice, it doesn't matter what anybody else's perception of you is. It really matters what God says about you. God says you belong to me. Oh, I know. I might just keep myself happy with this one. And the cool thing is it's only on page three. <laughs> Satan even masquerades himself as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Heaven isn't even going to be like what you picture. Why? Because there will be people there that you thought never would be there, and the people that you thought would be there might not be there. The people that you thought on Sunday morning, they all had everything perfect. Maybe they won't be there. Maybe the people that you thought didn't have it together, they might be there. So even heaven's perspective may be even different. The problem isn't your situation, it's your picture. And the perception is causing you way too much pain. That's why your perspective is essential to your progress. 
If you don't get that, that your, your perspective is essential to your progress. Some people are doing things that God never wanted them to do. How do I know? Because how many of you know people that hate their jobs? They're only doing their job because someone said that they had to do that. And it brings us right to Judges. So let's go there in Judges chapter 6. He says, or, yeah, 6. He says, so that was a, that was a long introduction, wasn't it? My God. But we'll go next week if we have to, because this is just way too good for people to miss. He says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so uh, oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in Mount the Clef's caves and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Malachites, the Mosquitoites, the Cellulites, and the Afraidites, all these guys... All the Eastern people, they invaded the country. And they camped on the land and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. And they did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. How many of that would make life incredibly miserable? They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. And it was impossible to count them on their camels. And they invaded the land to ravage it. Verse 6. Many of so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord God of Israel says, that I brought you up out of Egypt, out of a land of slavery. I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of the oppressors. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. Verse 10, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you uh, live. But you have not listened to me. And then in verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came down and sat under an oak tree that belonged to Joash, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. What's interesting in this scripture is, that, is this, that he did not even acknowledge the Lord. Gideon did not even acknowledge the Lord's declaration. He didn't know his identity through the eyes of somebody else. And when the angel of the Lord called Gideon a mighty man, a mighty warrior, he said, mighty man of valor, he's calling him by his God-given identity, not his human identity. He's calling him by what he sees, not by what his parents see. All his parents saw was him just Running away from the minute, he was just running away from his, from his the, the bow, and he was stuck in his wine press. And in the Bible, a given name is often synonymous with a God ordained identity or destiny. So the name Gideon means cutter down or destroyer, and Gideon is destined to be a leader who, with God's help, overthrows Israel's powerful enemy. But Gideon, however, he, he sees himself differently. How many, of you have, how many of you have ever heard God or felt God or some kind of inclination of God says, I want you to do this and I see you as that, but you thought it might have been pizza or you thought it might have been heartburn or you thought it might have been some incurable mental disease that, oh my God, he's hearing from God. And then you started to adapt and adopt your own identity. Oh, I'm just weak in my, in, in my family. I'm insignificant. I'm nobody. I live on the wrong side of the river. I live on, on the wrong side of the tracks. Gideon sees himself differently. Gideon sees himself as insignificant and powerless. And as a result, he's living in fear and weakness. And he's whimpering as a weakling in a wine press. And he's thinking, you know, what's happening? But God begins to initiate a new identity for Gideon. Ephesians chapter 2 and 10 says... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. It says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were, were wise with human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Why do you think that, that, that God picked out, you know, Gideon? Because in Gideon's mindset, that he was part of a, an insignificant family line. He felt insignificant. He felt useless. He felt worthless. But God has a way of taking the broken and making them battle worthy. 
It was interesting that when God calls Gideon, the young man doesn't comprehend his purpose or his identity. In fact, he is currently being and behaving the very opposite of what God has called him to be. He's about to come out of hiding and he's about to step into history. I don't know about you, but I, 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 I see these guys that are written in the Bible and I'm like, they're no different than you and I. Like, what is the last time somebody wrote something cool about us? The Acts of Impact Church. When I hear as of as the history, it's probably a small book. But wouldn't it be cool if decisions determine the direction of your destiny and choices changes careers? Then how do you realize that when you understand your identity in Christ Jesus, it changes behavior, and behavior changes cities, and cities changes provinces, and provinces changes nations. And then pretty soon, maybe somebody will write a book, and maybe your name will be in a book one day, or my name will be in a, in a book one day. Gideon is fearful. Gideon, Gideon is just like, I don't understand. Because in verse 13, he says, pardon me, Lord, Gideon said, but if I know, if, if the Lord is with us, I remember doing this as a, as a youth, when I was doing youth work. <laughs> Gideon would reply something like this. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Do not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and, and give us into the hand of Midian. I'm sorry, I do have to be myself. <laughs> the Lord turned to him and said, like Charlton has it. Go. <laughs> Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, Lord. But how can I save Israel? You should do this really good on the key. I'm holding my voice tonight. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my family. But the Lord said, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving them alive. And Gideon said, if I now found favor, see now he's grown up. Gideon said, if now I found favor in your eyes, because it's just killing me here. If now I found favor in your eyes, <laughs> he got killed. Give me a sign that is really you talking to me, please. The Lord said, I'll give you a sign. But I'm thinking about this whole story that Gideon had a distorted picture of God's original picture. God saw something so cool in him. And the truth of this message is one of the most important truths that you can learn in your entire life. That if you really grasp what it means to see yourself as God sees you, it'll change your life. Because Jesus said, you'll know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Listen, it doesn't say a doctrine will set you free. It doesn't say the truth of a doctrine will set you free. It says you'll know the truth. He's the truth. And the truth will set you free. That I get my identity, Daryl, from the truth. That I get my future from the truth. That I get my finances, that I get my goals, that I get my desires from the truth. That faith for the future is found when you focus on the face of the Father forever. Those are my F words today. So, five things. We'll see if we can get through them. Because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> it's just so miserable. Five things, really quick. Five ways that God pictures you so you can see yourself here. Number one, God sees you as acceptable. There's one thing that I've noticed, well, there's several things that I've noticed the older that I get, but there's a lot of people that they don't see themselves as acceptable. They see and feel like they have to jump through a bunch of hoops and over a bunch of hurdles just to get God's attention, or just to feel accepted, and just to feel loved. And I've come to realize at 59 now that it doesn't matter what you do. 
That it's not what you do that determines who you are. It's who you are that determines what you do. And when, and when you understand who you are in Christ Jesus, you can plop your hiding right there in the seat and never evangelize and never do anything but sit in God's presence and he's okay with that too. Because how I many of the more of God that you get on the inside, some of us, some people I know in church, they're just so huge, they couldn't, they're so huge, you've got presents, they couldn't fit out the door. I mean, they just, they just love to soak and all that kind of stuff. And I used to get really irritated by that. And now I'm like, you know, I get it. Because sometimes we've done so much stuff in the flesh and we've done so much stuff to gain people's attention. We've, gained, we've done so much stuff to be part of, you know, somebody's testimony. That we go out through the flesh and we, and we do stuff just because we know how to do it. And God says, you're doing it all in the flesh. It's all wood, hay, and stuff. And you're going to get some results. And that's all great. But everything you do really wasn't of me. Everything that you did was part of me. And I honored that. But sometimes there's things that we've done. And I know that I've done in 35 years of ministry. There's some things that I did just because I thought it was the right thing to do. And it really wasn't a God thing to do. I got good results. But God says, you know what? It, there's, there's good results, but I never told you to do it. Sometimes he says, I just want you to plop right there. I just want you to sit, soap, saturate, bathe, bath, pickle, marinate in my presence. Because when you get so full of me, then you're going to be so compelled to go out. And out of the abundance of your heart, then your mouth is going to speak and you're not going to do it in the flesh anymore. Oh, gosh. So God sees you as acceptable. Titus 3 and 7. Jesus treated us much better than we deserve. And he made us acceptable to God. And he gave us the hope. Of eternal life. And one of the most hurtful things in life is rejection. I have a dear friend. I haven't spoken to him in 40 years. His name is Danny Duval. Danny Duval was our quarterback in, in college. Danny Duval said, he said, one thing that I remember back in 40 something years that I never forgot. He said, rejection doesn't extinguish the spirit of boldness, it ignites it to a new level of fervency for the Lord. So when you're rejected, it should never ignite your, it should never, you know, will, um, extinguish your boldness. It should never, expect, you know, get rid of your fire. It ignites it. You know, people might not be superly accepted about your message. Even at the dealership, I tell them guys, like, hey, see you Sunday. No, you won't. Next day, see you Sunday, I'm sorry. No, you won't. See you One day, one of the jokers is going to come in here. They might watch it on Facebook. They might watch it somewhere. But I believe that one of the jokers is going to show up one day. Because the men and women of influence. Gideon's own heritage held him in hostage. And as a result, we spend most of our lives doing everything we can to avoid rejection. And we want acceptance more than we want anything else. And sometimes we even want acceptance from people that we don't even like. And we buy things we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even know. Because the need to accept is so profound that it drives most everything in our lives. It drives the kind of clothes we wear, the kind of car we drive, the kind of house you buy, the career you choose. So many of our decisions in life are really based on this desire for approval, the desire to be accepted, to be recognized, and to be significant. And God says, I see you as accepted already. You don't have to do all this junk. I see you accepted. And people do the craziest things just to be accepted. Gideon had nothing to lose because God was going to be with him. His confidence and his courage came from somebody who cared. Oh, I like that sentence. I thought it was full of seeds. That his confidence and his courage came from somebody who cared. And for the first time in Gideon's life, he felt connected. Do you see yourself there? Do you see yourself connected? Do you see yourself hanging on somebody who cares? Do you see yourself uh, with somebody that's going to fill you with confidence and fill you with courage? Do you remember when you were a kid and somebody would dare you to do something and they said, I dare you to do it and you do anything. You just dare it just so you can be part of the crowd. But there's a myth about acceptance and it's this, that if I can just get everybody to think I'm perfect, then they're going to accept me. So we put on masks. Who are you? We put on all these masks. I put on masks when I was a kid. Some of y'all don't know this. I had three dads growing up. I had, my second dad had three friends. You might know them. Tom, Con Tom Collins, Jack Daniels, and Budweiser. 
And these guys hung around my second dad all the time. But how many know Bud never made anybody wiser? <laughs> I had three dads growing up. I lived in an orphanage all my teen years. If ever there was a time that I could believe the statistics, if ever there was a time that I could have felt like Gideon being the weakest in my family, the one that never went to university, the one that never got a degree, the one that had three dads, the one who bowed to the statistics, then that could have been me. But I don't know if it was because God said something, I don't know if it was because a friend of mine said something, or I don't know if it's just because I'm Irish and Italian. But every time somebody said no, I just had to stand up and prove them wrong. Because I knew that my identity wasn't based on what somebody else said about me. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never do this. You live on that. You're on welfare. You have, you have food stamps. You blah, blah, blah. And every time I hear people about whining about their sorry, lame excuses growing up, I'm like, yeah, I, I understand. Get over yourself. I went through all that stuff. I know what it's like to be prophesied against, and I know what it's like to be prophesied for. But I remember a, a guy, Rex Lowe and Tony Maddox, and they drove me crazy, especially Tony, because he's like 70 years old. He's like, oh, you're still my son. Like, <laughs> but they came out to Bethesda Home for Boys. Look it up in Savannah, Georgia. Bethesda Home for Boys. And they took time out of the schedule, and they just started sharing Jesus with this little son when I was a teenager. And it was when I was 16 years old that I gave my life to Christ. Even went to the Jimmy Swagger thing. Old time, Holy Ghost, heaven sent, devil chasing sin, killing true blue, red hot, blood bought, God killing Jesus, love it, or can't be. Oh yeah. It was awesome. Second thing is that God sees you as valuable. So God not only sees you as acceptable, but he sees you as valuable. God, and Gideon needed a personal encounter with God. And God met him right where he was, giving him a sense of peace and purpose by his promised presence. Holy moly, did I write all that? That's kind of crazy. Sometimes just thank God that you're not in my mind going throughout the weekend. I got C words, P words, D words. All my favorite book is the fiction. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I got my thesaurus within my, what other kind of paragraphs that I use? I'm, I'm so distorted. But you think about it. He was giving him a sense of peace and purpose by his promised presence. There's nothing more permanent. Oh, here we go. There's nothing more permanent than his promised presence. He said, I'll, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That I'm going to be with you. I remember reading about Napoleon, Napoleon's soldiers. And when Napoleon takes his, takes, he said, one of the Napoleon's soldiers said, when Napoleon takes our hands and looks at us, we feel like conquerors. And there's something that changes in us when we listen to his voice and look full in his wonderful face that suddenly his priorities become the most important thing on our earth. And we find out exactly what our worth is. And let's just jump. And number three, because I want to get this over because I got another cool one next week, is that you're lovable. That his love is consistent. His love is, is unconditional. His love is there. And it doesn't matter what you've ever done or ever will do. And those of you who are watching my Facebook, it doesn't matter what you've done or ever will do. It'll never change God's love for you because he still loves you this much. The fourth thing that God sees is God sees you as forgivable. Gideon was chosen long before Gideon knew that he was another case of mistaken identity. Meaning that Gideon was in a situation he didn't know who he was. All he knew that he was just tending a wine press. That he never knew his identity. He never knew his true calling. And he actually probably ran away from that calling without even really knowing it. Isaiah 43 says, I am the God who forgives your sins. And I do this because I, uh, I do this because of who I am. That I will not hold your sins against you. God doesn't carry grudges. You might, I might, but God does not hold any grudges. Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the fifth thing and the last thing, everybody said, finally! <laughs> Don't say finally, because we'll, that'd be not good. That God sees you as capable. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 talks about this, is the capacity that we have comes from God. And it is he who made us capable of serving the new covenant. There's a massive epidemic of low self-esteem in North America. And one study shows that it's the number one problem among women in America. That, that they, they can't escape the sense of, of, of insecurity. Sometimes people role play. Sometimes people do all these, these crazy things just to be 
feel like they're capable and feel like they're, they're accepted. But how I many know well, there's a curse that needs to be broken? And Psalm 125, 1 2 says, no, no, Deuteronomy 23 5 says, But the Lord thy God turned the intended curse into a blessing because he loves you. That it's God's love that can break self esteem every day, all the time. We begin to sometimes focus on the truth. We need to affirm ourselves in the truth and start believing what God says about us. That God says that you're capable. 2 Timothy 3 17. Using the scriptures, he says that a person who serves God will be capable, having all that is needed to do every good work, and then he makes us capable. And I'll end with this. It's a story about a man named Fred Craddock. I found this online and it helps to illustrate, come on, Cheryl, helps to illustrate what I'm talking about here. That Mr. Craddock tells about the time that he was uh, vacationing in Tennessee. Fred and his wife were seated at a table at a restaurant where an old man came to them and asked, Are you guys on vacation? Well, yes, said Fred. We're having a good time. Well, what do you do for a living, the old man said. Fred was trying to get rid of this guy and he said, Well, I'm a preacher. Well, the old man said, Well, then tell me, tell me your preacher story. So he pulled up a chair and he sat down and he said, I was born an illegitimate child. I never knew who my father was. And that was very hard for me. The kids at school made fun of me and they called me names. And when I walked around our little town, I always felt that people were staring at me and asking that terrible question. I wonder who, is, I wonder who the father of this little boy is. He said, I spent a lot of time by myself and growing up, I didn't have many friends. One day a new pastor came to town and everybody was talking about how good he was. I've never gone to church, but one Sunday I decided I'd go hear him speak. He was good, so I, I kept coming back. But each time I went to church, I'd come in late and I'd leave early so that I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. Then one Sunday I got up, I, one Sunday I got so caught up in listening to the sermon that I forgot to leave early. I'm kind of like everybody up. The service ended, people stood up, and I couldn't get out the door. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and when I turned, that big, tall pastor was looking down at me. He said, what's your name, boy? Whose son are you? He said, when I heard that question, I just shook. But before I could say anything, the preacher said, I know who your family is. There, there's a distinct family resemblance. Why, you're the child of God. You know, mister? He said, those words changed my life, he said. The old man got up and left. The waitress came over and he asked me, you know who that was? No, said Fred. That's Ben Cooper, two-term governor of Tennessee. A man learned that he was the child of God and it changed his life. All the depression and all the wounds and all the hurts and rejection that he had through his life was eliminated by the power of that spoken, framed, remember, framed the word of God. And no one could, no longer could people diminish his sense of dignity because he was a child of God. And because of Jesus, I'm acceptable, I'm valuable, I'm lovable, I'm forgivable, and I'm capable. All because <coughs> Jesus helps me see through the eyes of his love. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans that I have you, have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for today. I'm so grateful that I got through this. That's awesome. Lord God, that there was so much stuff to unpack in that scripture about identity and who we see and what we see. And how we get our how our lives are often framed by the opinions of others. Rather than just listening to you. I pray, Father, today that as believers, that we would not live a life of mistaken identity. But God, that we would live a life that is a representation 
of what you declared and decreed in our lives. Father, I bless everybody today. I thank you, Lord, that here that they weathered through the storm. They paid no attention to the weatherman because he called them all. And God, I thank you, Lord, that today that our identity is not found in what our ID says. That even the picture, even what people perceive that my, my outward form really bears no resemblance of who I really am. Because what I really am on a daily basis through, as an oracle and as, a, as, a, 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 as someone who has heard and someone who just um, duplicates what you say in my spirit. Help me to be the closest thing to Jesus that my neighbors will 